Stanford University. Thank you very much, Dr. Berrick, for this very nice introduction. I feel very honored to be here and uh, be able to talk in front of all of you. I'm actually extremely impressed by how many of you took time tonight to come and listen to what uh, we have to say about ovarian cancer, a very important topic. Before I get started, I also want to express my uh, gratitude to Nora and to Whitney, also to Catherine Bailey from the Sample Women's Cancer Center that have organized this meeting tonight. And uh, we will have, as uh, Noah uh, explained, more of these meetings on a quarterly basis. So I will today uh, talk to you about ovarian cancer. And uh, we'll start with some statistics on this disease. I want to show you what the magnitude of the problem is. I will then summarize what we currently do for ovarian cancer, either for newly diagnosed patients or for patients that have recurrent disease. And then the third part of my talk will focus more on novel treatment strategies. And we have taken advantage now of the increased understanding of the biology of ovarian cancer as we have generated this over the last two decades in a lot of institutions, including at Stanford. I always say that the ovary is one of the most creative organs in the body. It's rather small. And I show you a picture here. This is the ovary next to the fallopian tube and the uterus. It consists of a lot of different cells. There are cells on the surface. We call them the surface epithelium. There are germ cells and the cells that hold it all together, the sex cord stromal cells. And all these different cell types can make very different tumors. So not all, every ovarian cancer is the same. Worldwide, the incidence of ovarian cancer, and those are statistics that date a few years back, but it always takes a while to generate this data, affects about 225,000 patients every year. So it's a little less than the other cancers from the breast, cervix, or endometrium, the uterus, as we usually see in women. But it does account for about 140,000 deaths all around the world. The statistics are similar here, at least relatively, in the United States. It's a 10th most common cancer among women in the United States. But it's the fifth most common cause of death from cancer disease with 14,000 patients, unfortunately, succumbing to this disease on a yearly basis. This illustrates that ovarian cancer among the female cancers is still the cancer with the highest death rate or mortality, because about 63% of patients diagnosed with this cancer will die from this. And we compare this to the other cancers, the endometrium, the cervix, or the vulva vagina, those are significantly less. Here is shown the five-year relative survival rate of patients at different stages of the disease. It's very important that we know that if you can diagnose ovarian cancer early on, this disease is highly curable. And if you look at this slide on the left side, I show you the survival rates for ovarian cancer patients. It's over 90% if you find this disease confined to the ovary. But it does drop significantly as we uh, proceed with the stages. So with distant disease sites, and unfortunately, ovarian cancer very frequently presents with distant um, disease, the survival rate drops. And we usually quote about 40% or mid 40% overall survival rate after five years. When you compare this to the other cancer from the cervix or the endometrium, again, here at early stages, the survival rate is very good. But we also have better ways to detect those cancers early on. But interestingly, when you compare these diseases here, when they metastasize to other sites, the survival is not as good. And that has to do with the fact that ovarian cancer is rather sensitive to chemotherapy, which we use to treat most of our ovarian cancer patients. Now, as I said, ovarian cancer comes in all different facets and forms and what we call histotypes. And there's something the pathologists will tell you when they put these uh, tissues under the microscope. We most frequently see the subgroup of epithelial ovarian cancers, and those are the ones that uh, originate from the surface. 
But even among this group, we have different histotypes, and they all have very fancy names. The papillary serous ones are the most common ones, but we also see so-called endometrioid, clear cell, mucinous, and undifferentiated carcinomas, and even mixed forms. So not every ovarian cancer is the same. We also see germ cell tumors more in the younger population, sex called stroma cell tumors, kind of in midlife. And don't forget that cancers like breast or GI cancers, gastrointestinal cancer, can go to the ovaries, and sometimes they're mistaken as ovarian cancers. Now, why is this important? We have learned over time that all these subtypes have a different prognosis. I show you one example here. Those are the epithelial cancers, the ones that come from the cervix. And when you just plainly look at the histology, the way they look like, this is the survival rate, the average survival rate in months. The endometrioid cancers have a better survival rate, an average, about 56 months compared to others, like clear cell mucinous. And that, again, has to do with the fact that their response to chemotherapy is very different. Or in other words, the clear cell and mucinous cancers are much more difficult to treat, particularly if we diagnose them at later stages. Now, we have learned a lot about the biology of cancer cells. And this is something that, particularly in recent years, have, has become very, very important for us. What we used to do and still do, we take the tumor out of the patient, we send it to the pathology, we put this on a microscope. However, we can do much more nowadays. We can do a very detailed analysis of a lot of different genes and proteins and other biological pathways that uh, these cancers can be characterized with. The uh, National Cancer Institute, over a decade ago now, started a really fabulous project that try to understand, at this time, almost all of our cancers better on a genetic basis. And they did make a huge effort to initially sequence and understand genes that are different in cancers, like brain, lung, and ovarian cancer. These databases have now allowed us to really generate a lot of more knowledge. And I encourage you, if you go home tonight, to look at this database of the Cancer Genome Atlas. You can do your own research if you computer savvy and just plug in something you're interested in. This is a public database that everybody has access to. And these type of publicly available databases are now generating a lot of new knowledge. Not knowledge we can use necessarily these days, but in the next few years will be extremely useful for us to design new therapies. And this is what it might look like in the future. The, the pathologist might not tell you, well, you have an epithelial cancer or a papillary serous cancer. Well, you might get the diagnosis of a cancer that has all these fancy genes mutated, proteins overexpressed. So we're looking at a very different way of classifying our cancers. And that is not only true for ovarian cancer, but also for endometrium cancer, breast cancer, and so forth. So I think in the near future, we will look at cancers in a very different way. How do we currently treat ovarian cancer? I like to look at ovarian cancer treatment in two different phases. The first phase is the initial phase of treatment. The majority of patients with ovarian cancer have some symptoms. So you start on the left side. The problem with the symptoms is they're very unspecific. And some of the most common symptoms are bloating, pain in the abdomen, something that all of us at some point might have. And therefore, the diagnosis is often delayed. The vast majority of ovarian cancer patients undergo surgery and then gets chemotherapy treatment. And we hope that the cancer never comes back. Now, unfortunately, a lot of patients recur with ovarian cancer. And that's, after an average, of about 19 to 24 months, depending on the type of cancer, depending on the treatment you, that you had prior. And then we're treating patients with recurrent disease with usually chemotherapeutic regimens. A lot of patients go to various types of chemotherapy, various numbers of cycles. We occasionally do surgery. We occasionally do radiation. But in essence, in the recurrent disease phase, it's difficult to control the disease forever. 
Now, primary surgery for ovarian cancer is quite extensive. And I assume that some of you know this very well. We do need to take all the cancer out that has spread. We need to do a full abdominal exploration. If the uterus is present, we take out the uterus, the ovaries, fallopian tubes. We take out lymph nodes, the omentum, which is a fat pad that hangs down here from the transverse colon, where cells like to settle in there. If the liver is involved, we do liver resection. We might have to take a spleen out. And if we can successfully achieve what we call a cytoreduction, or optimal tumor debulking, where only very minimal tumor is left in the abdomen, this is when the patients have the best prognosis. And I will show you this on this slide here. This is a study that was published many years ago, but it's still valid nowadays. And that shows you, on the left side, the uh, median survival in months here. So 40 months here and 20 months here is certainly a big difference. And here, on this axis, it shows you what percent of tumor was removed. So if your surgeon can achieve 100% removal of tumor, your prognosis from the beginning is so much better compared to a patient that had very little tumor removed because it wasn't possible. So it's important to have the right surgery done at the beginning. I show an example of this. Here's one of my patients that I treated at UCLA. This is stage four van cancer. This is the worst stage you can have. Now, can we cure patients with this? We can. It doesn't happen that often, but it's possible. And here's what I did for this patient. She was diagnosed in January 2009. I did what we just talked about. I uh, took out the uterus, the lymph nodes. Here's a mass in the abdomen down the pelvis. But she also had this here. This was a pretty good-sized tumor in the chest. So I called one of my colleagues in cardiothoracic surgery, and they took out this chest nodule. The patient then had chemotherapy, and she is to date, and this is her fifth year now after diagnosis, free of disease. So stage four of ovarian cancer does not mean you cannot treat this. Now, surgically, we are, have made some progress. Um, a lot of you might be used to big incisions, big surgeries. <clears throat> we have incorporated a lot of minimal invasive surgeries in our practice now. Here at Stanford, we're using robots, robots to do the surgery, but not alone. I make this very clear. The surgeon uh, is still the one <laughs> who guides the robot. We don't want to be out of work. <laughs> the patient lays here. There are small instruments going to belly. The surgeon sits here and guides with his uh, fingers and his foot pedals the uh, action of the instruments here. You have very small incisions. This is a patient here under surgery that has about five, six millimeter incisions. The instruments are inserted. And look at the really sophisticated ways of using those tools inside the abdomen. And this is a surgery, again, that we continue to develop. There's more and more patients that don't need big incisions anymore. They have these minimal invasive procedure, shorter recovery time. So we've gotten smarter on how to do our surgery. Now, chemotherapy, as I mentioned, after first surgery, the vast majority of our patients need some form of chemotherapy. And we usually, for the first chemotherapy, use a combination of platinum agents, carbon platin or cis platin, in conjunction or combination with taxane, taxil or taxotere, are most common. In general, on average, it's about six treatments. There are cycles. Every three to four weeks, you get chemotherapy, and then um, you, uh, um, it, you, you have some rest time. Now, the first line chemotherapy used to be, five, six years ago, just an IV treatment every three weeks. You would go to your doctor, get your chemotherapy. There was one or two different treatments, and uh, you didn't really have much choice. Now, nowadays we do because, again, we have gotten somehow smarter. So we can still use the intravenous approach with platinum and taxane, but we also now use interperitoneal chemotherapy, where we, where we put the chemotherapy directly into the abdomen. We sometimes use only platinum for patients that cannot take both drugs because they have too many side effects. We're using different combination partners with carboplatin. For example, carboplatin with gemcitabine, another drug, or doxorubicin. Or, and that's really the most creative approach, we're combining our conventional drugs with drugs that are fairly new. I will talk to you about this in a couple of slides. 
Now, before I do this, I want to just um, define some of the clinical trials jargon that we're using because we have ways of expressing um, effects of certain drugs on patients in a special way. And before we go any further, I want to make sure that we go through this as quickly. The first couple of things we're talking about is progression-free survival. This is how we look at new treatments. How uh, able is a new intervention, like a new chemotherapy drug, how able is it to increase the length of time during or after the treatment of cancer that a patient lives with the disease, but it does not get worse? So the disease is stable, or there's no disease, and it doesn't come back. That's what we call progression-free survival. The second important term to know is what's called the median overall survival, and that's defined as the time after which 50% of people or patients are still alive. So if I say there's a median survival of six months on this trial, that means that after six months, 50% of patients on this treatment are still alive. And third, we, are, we have a way of looking at this graphically when we compare treatments, and that's called the Kaplan-Meier analysis. And that's really used to measure the fraction of patients that are living for a certain amount of time after and during treatment. And I hope you can see this from the back, but you know, you look at the effect of the treatment over time. So the time is indicated here in years. And on this axis, you have the percent of patients that are surviving. So if you want to compare treatment A here in green to treatment B, you see that the patients with treatment A, after three years, there's about 60% of patients still alive, while compared to treatment B, probably 30% of patients are still alive. So you know that treatment A, just looking at this graphically, is better. So I'll show you a number of uh, graphs like this that come from real clinical trial. This is just an example. So how did we actually find out that interperitoneal chemotherapy is better than intravenous chemotherapy alone? Well, we did a trial, a clinical trial. And we infused the chemotherapy into the abdomen through a port here. And that port goes into the skin, then this tube goes into the abdomen, and we basically infuse our chemotherapeutic agent directly into the cavity of the abdomen where the cancer used to be. Now we did this trial in patients that had advanced disease. We took out all the cancer and then treated them either with intravenous chemotherapy only, or we used a combination of intraperitoneal and intravenous chemotherapy. And here are the results. Here are the kaplan meier curves again. When you look at the progression-free survival, so how long does it take before it gets worse? Well, if you look at the interperitoneal treatment, it's about 24 months. If you look at the intravenous therapy alone, it's about 18 months. So that's, in our terms, a big difference. But it also related in an increase in overall survival. And that's what you really want to see from clinical trials. You want to know, does this treatment make a difference in the long term? And here in this trial, this actually made a big difference. The patients that were on interperitoneal therapy um, were living an average of 50, 65 months, and on intravenous therapy alone, about 49 months. So a big difference. In 2006, when this trial was published, a lot of us switched over to the interperitoneal treatment. It's not something that's easy to tolerate, and it has to be the right patient and the right clinical situation for this to make sense. But this is a trial that really set this up for us. Now, it goes actually, it's actually a little easier than this. And here I show you a trial that uh, was published now a few years ago. The data actually has been confirmed. But we said, well, let's modify our conventional chemotherapy. And what we did here is, or the Japanese group did this, is carboplatin was still given every three weeks. But the taxol now, instead of given every three weeks, was given every week once a week. So we divided this big group of patients in two different groups, and we asked, what treatment is better, if you give Taxil every week, or if you give Taxil every three weeks and leave the carboplatin as is every three weeks? And here's the result. This is the uh, patients in red here that have Taxil every week and carboplatin every three weeks. And here in blue, the tax cell every three weeks, conventional treatment. And you can easily see by these lines, they're separated nicely. If you get the tax cell every week, it 
uh, does seem to be much better. And when you look at the progression-free survival in the group that gets it every week, we call this a dose-dense Taxol treatment. It's 28 months versus 17 months in the conventional group. So a simple modification in the timing of the drug administration made a big difference. And it's also true for the overall outcome. So at the end, is the overall survival better? And actually, it is on this trial. So here, you again, you see these curves separating. If you get this taxol after first surgery every week plus carboplatin, it seems like patients do better. Now, this data is being confirmed now in the United States, but a lot of us have changed over to giving patients taxol every week. It's not as well tolerated. There's more dose delays because it suppresses the bone marrow more than the conventional treatment. Now, once you're done with the first-line chemotherapy, so you had surgery, you had your first six cycles of chemotherapy, what to do then? And a lot of you probably had this discussion with your oncologists, physicians. We're now entering a phase where we have two options. We can either observe the patient and do nothing, or we can do what we call maintenance or consolidation therapy. The idea here is we've done the treatment, now we want to prevent the cancer from coming back. And we're giving some medication that the patient tolerates very well. Now, I don't want to summarize all these trials. It will take hours. And it's really not of great use because of all that we have tried over decades now, chemotherapy. We have tried interperitoneal chemotherapy, radiation therapy, vaccines, immunotherapy, hormonal therapy, nothing much actually has panned out to make a difference in the overall survival. Now, there's recent data, I'm going to show this to you in a few slides, that when we inhibit tumor vessels or the way that the tumor makes vessels, it's called angiogenesis, that now seems to make some difference, at least in the progression-free survival. So consolidation, yes or no, it's really a question that everybody needs to discuss with their own oncologists, physicians. But what if the cancer comes back? There's a lot of different aspects you have to consider if you decide on treatment. We're talking about patients that have platinum sensitive versus platinum resistant disease, and something that is very poorly defined. But if the cancer comes back within 12 months after completion of the first chemotherapy, we usually consider this a platinum-resistant cancer. So we don't think it responded as well to the platinum drug that you got as first-line treatment. If it comes back after 12 months, it's usually sensitive to platinum, but that, again, is not 100% certain either. So those definitions are very clinical definitions, but for the time being, we don't really have any better ones. You also have to ask, in discussion with the physician, what is the nature and the extent of the disease recurrence? Do you have an option for a second surgery? And that does work sometimes. Also, what kind of therapy does a patient tolerate? Is there a lot of bone marrow suppression, neuropathy, a lot of side effects that are the sequelae from the first chemotherapy? And then what are the goals for the uh, patient and the physician? For us, the goal is always a cure. But sometimes we have to be more realistic and we're looking then for prolongation of survival, symptom management, and in particular, a good quality of life for our patients. And then last, at one point, should you consider a clinical trial? So it's not an easy discussion that you have to have with patients that have recurrent ovarian cancer, um, but it is certainly something very important. Now, I mentioned second surgery. That sometimes makes sense. We do this actually quite a lot here. Second surgery, we think, does make sense if a patient has a long disease-free interval, at least more than 12 months after the last treatment. If there's isolated sites of recurrences, if there are one or two sites that we can completely resect, these surgeries make sense. They're always followed by chemotherapy, but it's something that I want you to discuss with your oncologists or surgeons as an option. And the patient, of course, has to be able to tolerate surgery. Now, chemotherapy for ovarian cancer. 10 years ago, the list was very short. Nowadays, the list is very long. It's growing only on a monthly basis. I highlighted here in red the drugs that we most commonly use here when cancer of the ovary comes back. We use, again, carboplatin, 
or cisplatin, there's topotecan, paclitaxel, also called taxel, or docetaxel, taxotere. We're using liposomal doxorubicin or doxyl, gemcitabine, but a lot of other drugs that you don't necessarily think about when you think of ovarian cancer. I want to point out that we use hormone therapy. Letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor, which um, does prevent estrogen production in your body. A lot of ovarian cancers, about 30%, we think, can respond to estrogens. If you block the action of estrogen on these cancers, a lot of patients respond, and it's an easy treatment to take. It has hardly any side effects. So we have gotten very creative, and a lot of this creativity, again, comes from our better knowledge of the biology of these tumors. Now, here is what unfortunately happens way too often. This is another one of my patients here, again from UCLA. This is a patient we started treating at this time point here, and in these black columns is shown the serum, serum CN25 level that, as you probably all know, is still the best tumor marker in ovarian cancer, and we follow treatment with these blood levels. So the patient had successful surgery, then in red here are the carboplatin treatment she had, in green are the uh, chemotherapies that did not contain carboplatin. We treat her successfully, and she's out for a long time, about 40 months, but then comes back with a lot of disease, so much that I can't do surgery. But we treat her successfully. See, this is a very, very high CN25 level, but we give her chemotherapy, a platinum, and look how it drops down to almost nothing. We get it down to zero. But then she comes back with cancer. We treat her again. And then the CN25 starts rising, which is an indicator of the cancer not responding anymore. And here, we call the disease platinum resistant. And in this situation, still today, it is difficult to find a drug that works. Now, this patient had many, many chemotherapies. And uh, when she finally passed away, she was 83 years old. She tolerated the chemotherapy. She went hiking in Mammoth, which is very high altitude. I think it's 6,000 feet at the base. But she did really well. She had a fabulous quality of life, and she lived a happy life till the end. And although this is not the type of situation that we want, we actually got her through a really happy time, after all. So let me now go on to my third part of the talk, which will focus on more novel treatment strategies. And again, this is taking advantage of our knowledge of the biology of ovarian cancer. Now, one focus field of research and clinical trials in ovarian cancer and other cancers in the last decade has been the targeting of tumor vessels. Here's a really nice schematic. See, tumors need a lot of nutrients. Nutrients come from bloodstream. The tumors have figured out how to actually grow their own blood vessels, and they're like parasites. They're taking it from the systemic circulation of the patient, and this is how they grow big, how they metastasize. Now, many years ago, a very creative surgeon, actually, Julius Folkman, had the idea, well, if you kill these blood vessels and deprive these tumors of their nutrients, maybe we can also see tumor shrinkage. You know, after many years, we have drugs now. Um, this is the first one, really, that was ever studied, Avastin or Bevacizumab. It's nothing else but an antibody that you get infused. And what this antibody does, it blocks one of the important factors in the patient's bloodstream that stops these tumor vessels from growing. It does more than that, but that was the initial idea. So if you deprive the tumor of the way they grow blood vessels, can we then get treatment effects? Do these tumors shrink? Well, we studied this, again, quite extensively. And in the initial studies, it looked as such a good treatment, even in patients with platinum-resistant disease, that we decided, well, let's then use it in patients that have first-line chemotherapy. So we did what we always did. We did surgery on advanced ovarian cancer patients. We then treated them either with conventional taxol carboplatin, or we treated them with carboplatin, taxol, and the Avastin. And then in the third arm, we even continued the Avastin for 15 more treatments after we completed the carboplatin, taxol, Avastin treatment. So long treatment. And this, again, is called the maintenance or consolidation treatment. 
And the hopes were really high that this is going to make a big difference. But I'll show you those curves now that you're very familiar with. Here's the progression fee survival. The curves are actually very close. And all we got now from this treatment was an increase in the progression free survival, so the time that, uh, the, uh, that it takes for the patient to get worse, or the tumor to get worse, by 3.8 months, close to four months. That's not a lot. And unfortunately, the overall survival at the end has not changed with bevacizumab. And although it's a drug that I think all of you are aware of, the effects that we have seen have been really only incremental. We're starting to learn how to use this drug a little bit better now, and maybe there are patients that benefit from Avastin more than others, and here's a trial that might show this. Those are the Europeans that did the same trial. They found basically um, the same thing in the overall population, but they found a group of patients that they consider at very high risk for progression and relapse. They call this a high-risk progression group. Those are patients that present with a lot of tumor, a tumor that under the microscope looks very aggressive, a tumor that is difficult to treat surgically. And those patients actually tend to benefit uh, the most from Avastin. Here you see an increase in the progression-free survival of about six months, but you also saw about a 7.8 months increase in the median overall survival. But again, this is a group of patients that in general doesn't do as well because they start off with a tremendous amount of tumor disease. But I think that this trial was well done, and uh, in that sense, this data has some validity. And we take this into account when we talk to patients about the Vastin treatment after their first surgery. Now, um, this is another trial, and I'll just show you one example of now many trials that have used bevacizumab or Avastin in combination with chemotherapy in patients with recurrent ovarian cancer. And here's one of them. This, in, uh, this color is the patients that got the combination treatment. This is recurrent ovarian cancer, difficult to treat. And this are, those are the patients that got chemotherapy only. And you did see about 3.3 uh, months increase in the progression-free survival, at least. So, in conjunction with chemotherapy, for recurrent ovarian cancer patients, this drug seems to make a difference, at least in the progression-free survival. Now, unfortunately, the overall survival in this trial is not quite ready yet, the data, but it doesn't look like, again, it changes the overall survival. And that's a problem we have with a lot of drugs nowadays, unfortunately. Now, bevacizumab is not without any side effects. It increases your blood pressure. It can decrease your kidney function. It can cause bleeding. It can cause blood clots, both in arteries and vein, and it can cause bowel perforation. And in the early phases of using Avastin, we had about 5% on, of patients on these drugs perforating their bowel, which is a difficult situation to treat. I show you one of my patients here. This many years ago, Avastin was brand new. Here's a patient that I treated with Avastin. You see the rectus sigmoid colon. This is, a large part, this is the last part of the bowel on an X-ray. And see this here, all the white contrast material? It came out of the bowel, and that not only did it go into the abdomen of the patient, it also went right into the bladder, in the urinary bladder. So this is, a, this is a not an insignificant side effect in patients with ovarian cancer. We have nowadays more control of Avastin, but I want you to keep this in mind. A lot of oncologists are not necessarily mentioning these type of complications, but they do happen. Now, I'll show you another drug now that was just presented at our American Society of Clinical Oncology. This is a big meeting this year in Chicago. But they presented a drug here that patients took orally. This is a pill once a day after they were done with first-line chemotherapy. So they did carboplatin, taxol, and then they gave patients this drug here. It's called patsopanib. Patsopanib does something very similar to what Avastin does because it prevents tumor vessels from growing. So they had one group of patients that got the patsopanib and the other group that only got placebo, meaning it's an inactive drug. And nobody really knew who got what. 
But then they analyzed the data, and what they have seen is that these curves look close together, but I think it's a little distorted here on the graphics. There was a difference about 5.6 months on the progression-free survival. And that's the first trial as a maintenance therapy that ever showed that an oral drug can increase progression-free survival in the maintenance phase by this much. It's better than Avancin. Remember, Avancin was not even four months. This one is 5.6 months, so we're getting better. We don't know what it's going to do in the overall survival. There's a certain trend, but the data is not ready, really. So again, making progress here, targeting tumor vessels. So I'll switch gears a little bit now. I'm not, I know I'm taking you on the rights to a little bit of biology here, but uh, as Dr. Berg mentioned before, I have a knack for science, and I like molecular biology. But I take you through this, and hopefully uh, we can clarify this later if there's questions regarding this. But what we have understood now in the last few years is how cancer cells react to chemotherapy. So, what does chemotherapy actually do? What does radiation do to the cells? Why do they die? Well, a lot of times, particularly carboplatin, breaks their DNA. See, this is a fancy double helix here, the Watson and Crick one that we all know. So when you give chemotherapy, you hit the cells, the DNA breaks in many pieces. Radiation does the same thing. Now, when you do this to a normal cell, the normal cell can actually repair the DNA. Now, look, it looks like a normal cell. It survives it, the normal cell. Now, the cancer cell can't do that that much. The cancer cell is actually defective in repairing its DNA, which we can use to our advantage, because we can explore these mechanisms <clears throat> to um, take advantage in a therapeutic setting. So if you know you hit them with chemotherapy, the DNA is broken, prevent the cell from repairing its own DNA. And here now comes a player that you all very familiar with, is, is BRCA, the brias brca mutation, um, which um, about 12% of ovarian cancer patients have. And that BRCA gene is actually responsible for making a protein, and that protein has to do a lot with DNA repair. Now, you imagine, if you have a mutation in this gene, it doesn't work very well, Yes, you have a high risk of developing ovarian cancer, but that ovarian cancer will also have the BRCA mutation, and these cells are not really able to repair their DNA very effectively. So can we use this to our advantage? Actually, we can. And now this gets really complicated now, um, but I don't want to spend much time on this. We have developed a new class of drug. It's called the POP inhibitors. POP is a very necessary enzyme to repair DNA, and it works in conjunction with BRCA. So if the cell cannot repair DNA because it's missing BRCA, and you, in addition to this, chemically, with the drug, inhibit this other necessary enzyme called POP, the cells might die. That's very true in cell culture, but is it also true in clinical trials. I show you here one of the landmark trials published about three years ago by uh, Dr. Ode Tzida Sina in um, Los Angeles. These uh, patients here took Olaparib. Those are patients with ovarian cancer. Olaparib is a POP inhibitor. And these patients all have BSCA1 and BSCA2 mutations, so their cells conceptually should not be able to repair the DNA damage. And when they took this drug, look at these patients here marked with the red arrow. Those are the uh, percentages that the tumor shrank. And so uh, close to 50% of the patient had some tumor shrinkage. And a good percentage had tumor shrinkage more than 30%, which we consider actually significant. And this is a single drug, recurrent ovarian cancer patients, works in a completely different mechanism than we've ever explored. Now, does it work uh, in uh, patients that have relapsed of ovarian cancer? We have studied this further. This is actually a German trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. Here are patients that have platinum-sensitive disease, so recur more than 12 months after the first chemotherapy. They have BSCA mutations, and they get an oral drug twice a day. And look at the curves here. Those are the patients that took the drug, and those are the patients that didn't. 
Here is the increase in um, the um, progression-free survival. It's four months on the placebo and 11 months on Lepirid. So about 50% of patients close to a year responded to this, which is quite tremendous. Again, it's an oral drug, has very little side effects. It's nothing like the regular chemotherapy. Now, um, it seems to also, um, at least in some trials, there's some suggestion that it might increase overall survival. In this trial, it didn't so quite do this. Here's a placebo at 32 months and 35 months or laparib, so a little bit of a difference, but clinically probably not so significant. So the PARP inhibitors, um, to summarize, are a group of drugs together with the anti-tumor vessel inhibitors that we have focused a lot of our clinical trials on. I can tell you that all over the world, there are a lot of different clinical trials going on that explore the effect of these drugs more. Laparap is in clinical trials. We have many other PARP inhibitors. But particular, if any one of you is interested and has a BRCA mutation, or even if you don't, those are drugs that are very promising. They're not approved for ovarian cancer yet, but I think they will at some point. Now, the last part of my talk will uh, focus on the immune system. There's been, as you probably know, a lot of interest in using the immune system to fight cancer. The immune system is very complex. And a lot of you might remember this here from basic biology. We have a lot of different cells in the immune system. We have some part of the immune system that doesn't need to learn how to function. It's the innate immunity here with macrophages and natural killer cells. Uh, white blood cells, and then we have some on the other side. Those are cells that need to learn how to fight viruses and cancer. Those are B cells that make antibodies and T cells that can really kill cancer cells. But what do we do with these cells? Are they really important in ovarian cancer? <clears throat> well, again, in the last decades, we have understood a lot more about what cancers actually look like. The cancers are not only tumor cells. There's a lot of other cells in there. There are macrophages, TMB cells, blood and lymphatic vessels, white blood cells, fibroblasts, they make connective tissue. All of this sits in the tumor. And we know now that all these cells have importance. They promote tumor growth. They fight the immune system. So they're not really effectively fighting those tumor cells, otherwise the tumor wouldn't grow. But why don't they do that? Now, many years ago, a good friend of mine, George Cookers, at the University of Penn, showed very conclusively that T cells, a subgroup of white blood cells, are very important in ovarian cancer. He has a tumor that has all these brown cells in it. Those are all T cells. And George basically said, well, let's see, when patients have T cells in their tumors versus patients that don't have T cells in their tumors, do they do better? And here's the data. You know these graphs now very well. Look what happens in your overall survival when you have T cells in your tumor. It's so much better compared to patients that don't have T cells in their tumor. So it's a great readout and a great uh, piece of evidence that these T cells seem to be very important. Now, how do we now activate these immune cells to treat ovarian cancer? I'll show a little schematic now. So this is a tumor cell. It's called the ovarian cancer cells. This is a macrophage. Those are the things that eat. Pac-Man-like cancers and viruses. They're natural killer cells. Those are the cells that don't need to learn how to kill, but they're inactivated by the cancer. And then we have those T cells. And they sit in the tumor. But why don't they attack the tumor? Well, I'll show you why. Because the tumor says, stop. The tumor knows how to block the immune system from fighting it. And it does this in a very, very smart way. Because otherwise, again, the tumor would be digested by the immune system. Now, what the tumor doesn't know is that we have now figured out a lot of these molecules, these immune inhibitory molecules. And I'll show you some of them here, a couple of them. One is called CD47, and that's Dr. Irv Weissman, who is a stem cell researcher here at Stanford, who has found this. If CD47 is the stop sign, that's what the tumor cells are making. These macrophages are being told, don't eat me. He actually calls it the don't eat me signal, believe it or not. There's another protein, it's called PDL1, that is another big stop sign for T cells. And if you have followed some of the recent headlines in solid tumor oncology in the last two years, the PDL1 or PD1 inhibitors in melanoma 
have had a, have a great effect on those patients. And we're trying this in ovarian cancer now. So we have inhibitors now, new drugs that can inhibit CD47 or PDL1. But these trials are very too early. They are going on. The CD47 trial will start next year here at Stanford. And PDL1 uh, trials, we have them open here at Stanford. And I'm happy to discuss it with you in more details. But let me show you how CD47 thing we think might work. So here again, CD47 is a shield that tells the macrophages, don't eat me. Now, if we take the shield away by blocking CD47, and we can do it, for example, with an antibody, can we get these macrophages to eat the cancer cells? Well, we don't know whether this works in patients. But we do know this, and this again is Dr. Weissman's data. When you have ovarian cancer patients where the tumor makes a lot of CD47, I call it CD47 high, here in red, look how poorly these patients do compared to patients whose tumor do not have CD47. It's very low. So here the shield is very strong. Here the shield against the macrophages is not that strong. And look how much better these patients do. Now, they took animals, mice, and said, well, let's try that. Let's get an antibody against CD47 here. And then you see these colored blue and red dots here. This is actually tumor disease. So they put ovarian cancer in these mice. And look what happened when you treat them with anti-CD4. There's no tumor growth here. When you compare this to animals that got placebo, they're full of cancer. And this is a tremendously effective result. This is very impressive by all measures. And that's some trial that we are working out right now and hopefully have this up and running in the next few months. We're also working on a trial where we use cytotoxic T cells here. How, we can, how do we get these cells to eat the tumor? Well, imagine this. You have the covalent cancer cells here. You have the T cell here. The T cell doesn't necessarily know what the ovarian cancer cell looks like, so they have to tell it then. And the way we do this is we uh, instruct the T cell to learn how certain proteins look like on the cancer cell. And we do know about some of these proteins of ovarian cancer. Now, all we need to do is really take a receptor here that recognizes this, what we call antigen, make a lot of these T cells, and then reinfuse them into patients. We call this adoptive T cell transfer. And the modification of these T cells is done with so-called viruses. As Dr. Berg mentioned, I come out of gene therapy. That's what gene therapy is. It modifies other cells with viruses and other tools. But we can do this. And we have a clinical trial like this started at UCLA while I was still there. We are trying to get this restarted here at Stanford. What we're going for is what's called the NYE1 antigen. Some of you might know that this is a very immunogenic antigen in ovarian cancer. The nice thing about this, too, is that it's only in the cancer cells. It's not on the healthy cells. So it's very specific. So hopefully we get you some update on this in the very near future. Clinical application of this, you as a patient, you would come in, you take blood from the patient, get the T cells out, genetically modify them. Within four or five days, they go back into you, find the cancer, kill the cancer. That's the principle, and we hope certainly that this is going to work. There is some preliminary data from other trial sites where this actually has shown some very good efficacy, but we'll see whether we can duplicate these efforts here. So I'm going to conclude my talk briefly with pointing you towards how to find clinical studies for ovarian cancer. When you go to the website of the Stanford Cancer Institute, you have a search engine that can find cancer clinical trials. There are over 300 cancer trials currently going on. Now, I did this for you for ovarian cancer this afternoon. There are 12 trials open now. Here is one that Dr. Barrick is heading here. This is a study, chemotherapy plus a very novel antibody. I encourage you to look at this trial site. And if you're interested, we have contacts for you that you can simply call up and discuss what you might be interested in. Also, the uh, National Institutes of Health has a wonderful website. It's called clinicaltrials.gov. They have, this is off this afternoon, 150,850 150, studies, location in 50 states and 185 countries. This is not only cancer, by the way, but you don't need that many studies. You can search for ovarian cancer, and here are how many there are, 1,929 on this website. 
So if you're willing to travel and look beyond the region, there's a lot of trials that you might be candidate for. I, again, encourage you to look at this. Not all these studies are open. This one, for example, is recruiting. This one is active but not recruiting. So look through this and be happy to give you advice if you have questions about the details of any of those. Every trial has a phone number that you can call, whether in New York, in London, or where this might be. But we do these trials now on a very international level. So last but not least, I want to introduce our entire division here. You met Dr. Barrick at the beginning, introduced me. I also want to really point out uh, uh, Catherine Bailey, who has just become the administrative director of all the cancer clinical care programs here at Stanford. She is wonderful. She is there in the back. Catherine, thank you for coming. Um, so she has really done a fabulous job to get our Stanford Women's Cancer Center to the place where it is today. Uh, those are the faculty members, Dr. Teng, Dr. McLaughlin, you know me, Dr. Cheng or Wong, then Dr. Lee, and Dr. Karam is going to join us from UCLA in a couple of weeks. Uh, he's an expert in robotic surgery. We have excellent nurse practitioner here with Bridget and Arati. And um, uh, we have Ashley Powell, who is the director of our clinical trial uh, division. Please call Ashley if you're interested in any of our clinical trials. Um, we will have more talks that uh, will focus on women's cancer. We have from Mark Pegram, who was just in the audience. He is the director of the breast cancer program at uh, Stanford. Um, confirmed the breast cancer talk. We're going to talk about genetics of breast event and endometrial cancer. Dr. Karam will talk about robotic surgery and gynecologic oncology. We'll have talks about cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, and survivorship, all very important. And if you have any input, let us know. We are very open to suggestions. I think we can come up with speakers for any of those important topics. So um, I want to um, also mentioned that the Stanford Cancer Institute has a fabulous executive team. Without them, we couldn't do anything. Uh, it's headed by Dr. Beverly Mitchell, who is really a very visionary director of the Stanford Cancer Institute. And uh, Dr. Mitchell has put a huge emphasis on women's cancer. And honestly, one of the reasons I was so excited to come to Stanford is that Stanford has made a very focused commitment to make progress in gynecological cancers. This is my family. I always conclude. We moved to Palo Alto um, about five months ago. We're very happy as my son Alessio is five. My daughter Alegria, she is three, and this little baby boy here, that's my wife who's in the back in the audience. We do enjoy Stanford a lot, I got to tell you. We had a good time here. So thank you for having us here, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Levels? Good question. We are right now doing it on fresh tumor tissue. So um, it will probably be uh, a uh, more simple test, but for the time being, it, ha it has to be a biopsy and testing of the tissue. How about if, um, you know, sometimes after you have surgery, they keep a sample? Can you repeat the question? When the Okay. Sure, sure. I'm sorry. So the question was whether CD47 would be a blood test. The answer is that it'll, it's not a blood test for the time being. It's looking at the fresh tumor tissue. So during surgery, they keep, they keep samples of the tissue. Can you test the CD47 on old sam older samples? So the question is whether you can um, take tissue during surgery, test it then. Yes, that's true. Can you use old samples? Um, we are working on ways of testing all those samples. It's not quite ready for prime time yet. And, um, have you seen a lot of side effects for pazopinib? Pazopinib has, uh, the question is pazopinib, that's the drug that taking as a pill after completion of first-line chemotherapy can increase progression-free survival by about 5.6 months. Yes, the side effects are similar to what we've seen in Avastin. We see uh, high blood pressure. We see effects on the kidneys. Um, but uh, they are uh, very acceptable. Please. I wonder if you could help me understand something more about the CA-125 test. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about this, but I'm getting some conflicting 
uh, opinions, and maybe that's the state of the, the, the um, academics about it. Some will say the results can vary by lab. In other words, lab A will give different than lab B. Some by different test methods. Some will say that non-cancer causes can cause the numbers to change. To change. Some will focus on importance of absolute values, like 35 is the, uh, you know, the, the one you want, or, or 20. Others will say that the trajectory is the important thing. So can you help uh, clear this up for me? Yeah, that's a great question. The question pertains to the serum tumor marker CN25. Um, the question is, is very um, um, multidimensional, as I would put it, but you're asking some very good questions, so let me just go through them. CN25 is a blood test. It's a big glycoprotein that swims around in the blood. Some tumors make it, some don't. It's not very specific. What it means that not only ovarian cancer makes it, but also uh, benign conditions can elevate the CN CN25 level. For example, an enlarged uterus, fibroids, endometriosis, if you have an infection of the ovaries, fallopian tubes, if you have fluid in your abdomen from liver disease, heart disease can elevate the CN25. Um, so patients that have a cyst on the ovary don't necessarily need a CN25 level, which might be positively ele uh, falsely elevated. Now, we're using it mostly during treatment and get to gauge the effect of certain chemotherapeutic agents. It is true that different labs have different normal values. The most, current, uh, the most common ones are 20 units per milliliter or 35. It depends on the test. It depends on the lab. What is more important than the normal range is the uh, dynamic of the CN25. I'll give you a couple of examples. If uh, your CN25 is elevated before surgery, then undergo surgery, and then have chemotherapy, we can extract information regarding your overall prognosis from the way the CN25 drops. The faster it drops, and particularly if it's normalized, either below 35 or below 20, depending on the lab, after the second cycle, that's when you get the best prognosis. If it's a very slow drop in CN25, we know the cancer doesn't respond this well. It's very important that regardless of what lab you're choosing for the CN25, choose the same type of test or choose the same lab. And that's why we like to do this here at Stanford in one lab where we have certain calibrations and certain ways of doing these tests, and they're always the same. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm going to think about it and probably come back with another one. Uh, happy to. I have a question about that. If in surgery it's over 4,000, yeah. and then before you start your chemo, it has dropped after the surgery to 900, mm -hmm. then today it's down to 239. Can we expect, as we go through the six or five more cycles of chemo, that it will continue to drop down, or can it fluctuate back and forth? Yeah. So the question is, patient that had surgery with the highest CN25 level, you mentioned 4,000, dropped down to 900 after surgery, and now is down to 200 after some chemotherapy. Can we expect to, for this to go down further? Well, in the vast majority of patients, that's exactly what happens. We usually find a, what we call a plateau. So it goes down to a certain level and then stays there. And for most patients, that's within the normal range. Let's say it plateaus around 15, 16. We watch this very carefully as a plateau. Um, it usually doesn't fluctuate as much. However, there are situations, as I mentioned before, where patients develop a second event, like heart disease, liver disease. Um, those, thing, those type of events can falsely, at least temporarily, elevate the CN25. So it's not a perfect marker. The other piece of information I want to give you now that you're talking about CN25, I actually took these slides out just before I uh, came today. There's a big study that the uh, British did. They did that. They had patients um, undergoing surgery, chemotherapy, and then they said, well, half of the patients are going to tell them and their doctor what the CN25 level is, and the other half will not know. Okay? So the idea was the patients that know the CN25 level, we, we find the disease early on. So we treat them early on, they will do better. The other group that we don't tell, they will never really be diagnosed early on, 
or they only get diagnosed when they have symptoms, and those patients don't do that well because we don't treat early enough. The outcome of the study was, and you know, you might guess that, there was absolutely no difference. Whether you know this here on 25 level or not, does not make a difference. So in a certain sense, that was a frustrating study for us. We didn't expect this. Um, but it also points out how you shouldn't be so really focused on the CN25 level. It's not a perfect marker. We're working on other level, HE4. Some of you might have that had, uh, or have that had done. Um, HE4 is another marker that we might be able to follow better. We're not quite sure whether this is going to make a bigger difference, but we have new ways of looking at early recurrence. And we need to develop better drugs to treat early recurrence better. Four. Yeah. How, uh, how close is the, what you talk about on ovarian cancer relatable to peritoneal uh, cancer? And also. Yeah, that's a very good question. So the question is um, is ovarian cancer comparable to primary peritoneal cancer? We don't treat them much different. We consider this kind of the same disease at this point. Of the uh, carboplatin and Paxil is, uh, are they about the same uh, regimens for both? Yes. The use for the chemotherapy treatment for primary peritoneal cancer versus ovarian cancer is very comparable. Did I understand from your slides that platinum resistant cancers, that we don't have much that will treat them? It's difficult to treat platinum resistant disease, that's correct because platinum resistance is really a hallmark of chemotherapy resistance in general. Uh, would that maybe be imply that someone might be a better candidate for something like Avastin or the pen? Yeah, so the question is treatment of platinum resistant disease, and that's something we can certainly talk about in a different setting. Um, patients with platinum resistance do respond to signal agent Avastin. Um, we have newer drugs, which we all hope will make the treatment of platinum or chemotherapy-resistant patients easier and better. But in general, the response, once the tumor is chemotherapy-resistant to any chemotherapy, is much lower compared to when the tumor was still sensitive to platinum. sheer number of you know, chemotherapeutic agents that are out there now. So I've, I've done some reading of where they were talking about assay testing. Yeah. And I guess I was just, but I've heard kind of varying opinions on how useful it actually is. And I was wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, great question. So the question pertains to do you have assays um, that you can use to predict the response to chemotherapy or the resistance of certain drugs? In general, these essays are not giving us much useful clinical information. They're giving some prognostic information. We have data that shows that if you do these essays, they're usually cells that are put in cultures in your lab. They're then treated with chemotherapeutic agents. And then people just look at what actually are these cells responding to or what are they resistant to. Again, it's not great guidance for chemotherapy. In other words, if it works in the cell culture dish, that doesn't mean it works in the patient. But it gives you some prognosis. So if you see that the patient is resistant to a lot of drugs, or the cancer cells in the lab are resistant to a lot of drugs, that usually also means that they're resistant in the patient. What determines if uh, a doctor decides to test a ovarian cancer patient for the BRCA gene? Because I know some people have been and some haven't, and I don't know why. Yeah, that's a great question. So the great, uh, question pertains to who should be tested for BRCA, one and two mutations. The short answer that I can give you um, is everybody. Okay. So, I well, well um, it's the, the, when I say everybody, that's not so easy to really to sell. But most, a lot of us think that we should probably do BRCA testing in every patient that diagnosed with ovarian cancer because we're missing too many people. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, effort going on to push it through the insurance companies. It's an expensive test. 
uh, we still recommend that patients that are concerned about BSEA have a family history, go and see the genetic counselors. Patients that are young and develop ovarian cancer and the age of 50 uh, definitely should go and see a genetic counselor. It's always best to get information about what that test might mean for you, how to interpret the test, what the family should do before you actually go and have this test done. So there's a lot of different facets of this discussion that need to be carefully really looked at before you get this test done, in my opinion and the opinion of many others. Is it too late for me to get the test done? Is this my third, second recurrence? The question is, is it too late to get a test done for BSEA if you have recurred with ovarian cancer? No, it's, it's not too late. As a matter of fact, if you look at the clinical trials with POP inhibitors, these clinical trials, uh, a lot of them are selecting for patients that have BSEA mutations. So you might not have a strong family history of ovarian cancer, but you might still be a BSEA mutation carrier. So these trials usually screen patients for that. But, uh, so the treatments could, could have been altered or could be different uh, if you have BSEA? So it, the question is, when you're a BSEA mutation carrier, will the treatment be altered? Um, when it comes to POP inhibitor trials, yes, you are more likely to be a candidate for them. But other than uh, POP inhibitor, at this point, there's no really a specific BSCA mutation carrier treatment. If the insurance company insists that you see a genetic counselor, and if you're adopted, what, what point? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question is, the insurance company tells us see a genetic counselor, but you adopt it, so you don't you don't know your family, your biological family. Well, that's a really good question, one that I haven't really faced yet. So, um, I don't know how the genetic counselor look at this, and you know, but they know your ethnicity, they know your ethnic background, um, and you know, when we talk about the population of Ashkenazi Jewish people, we do know that they have a 2.5% chance of having a BSA-1, BSA-2 mutation. So if somebody as a genetic counselor finds, just based on the information that you personally can provide, any sort of risk factors, they will accept that you need to get tested. So I would not say don't go, follow what the insurance companies say, and hopefully they'll accept that. They found it uh, uh, peritoneal cancer than ovarian cancer. Does your research uh, include that area? So it's a very good. That's a very good question. Um, we don't really know because um, I'm, I'm just saying this much. Primary peritoneal cancer is much less frequent than ovarian cancer, but and you'll see this in the literature in the next few years, it's very difficult to know whether, whether one thing is primordial cancer and the other cancer is ovarian cancer because sometimes you just don't know where it came from. It's a distribution of these cancers inside the abdomen. We study them both together, so we lump them all together at this point, and uh, again, for treatment and research purposes, at least right now, it doesn't make so much of a difference. Okay, good. so the question is, and you probably heard this, um, do we, do, are you at risk of other cancers? The big cancers are breast cancer and ovarian cancer for women. Yeah, it's usually a high-grade series of ovarian cancer. And the other thing that we know now is that the majority of these cancers come from the fallopian tube, not the ovary. They just spread secondarily to the ovary or inside the abdomen. Um, the second question pertained to uh, the screening for BSEA mutation carriers. That's unclear. We still don't have enough clinical trial data in screening trials uh, for even the high-risk population. Where we can, in general, recommend this type of screening, however, uh, the, uh, um, there are task groups in the United States that do recommend that you get screened for ovarian cancer with ultrasound and CN25 
um, when, before uh, the age of uh, the youngest person that was ever diagnosed in your family, or at the age of 35. But those NCCN guidelines are really not well substantiated at this point from clinical trials. Um, again, things like this we are studying and we hope to have at some point a better blood test, a better uh, ultrasound modality to be more sensitive because the idea really is to discover these ovarian cancers very early on. And I showed you those early ones we can cure in over 90%. So let's do a couple of more questions and um, yeah. Um, so you heard the question, this recurrent ovarian cancer, there's a lesion in the liver and lung. She had interperitoneal treatment. Um, it's difficult to say from my position right now, there's a lot of other things that we need to consider um, it, before I can answer this, but I'm happy to see your daughter give her advice in a different setting. Definitely, you know, if you talk to Catherine in the back, we can make sure she gets set up in our clinic. Potentially, yeah. Absolutely. And I have a question on BRCA. I have the BRCA1. I've had breast cancer and ovarian cancer. What is the difference between BRCA1 and BRCA2? I didn't seem to have the two, I just had the one. Yeah. So uh, the question is what's the difference between BRCA1 and BRCA2? Just very brief, there's a lot of differences. They're totally different proteins. Um, they have different functions. If you look at this biologically, the uh, risk of developing ovarian cancer is also different. It's up to 50, 55 percent for BRCA mutation carriers and uh, around 25 percent for BRCA2 mutation carrier. BRCA1 mutation carrier tend to uh, develop ovarian cancer, breast cancer early on in life earlier on in life and BRCA mutation carry a little bit later. There's a lot of other differences, but I hope that we, you know, when we get the geneticists to talk to you about these specific issues that you get more specific information. Let's do one more question. I think right now, then we have to break. Good. Please. Um, the, uh, the question about the letrozole yeah. to prevent estrogen production. Is that an easy drug for the doctor to prescribe? Absolutely. So the question is letrozole. I mentioned this is a drug that, that blocks estrogen production in the, bo in the body, actually in fat cells. Um, it's an easy drug to prescribe because it's, uh, it's, it's off the shelf. Uh, it doesn't have to be approved for ovarian cancer. You can take this uh, at the prescription of your doctor. It's 2.5 milligrams once a day, easily tolerated, causes a little bit of joint effect sometimes, but it's really insignificant. I had really good experience with a lot of my patients that didn't need to take anything else, even with recurrent ovarian cancer, for many months. So it doesn't always happen that patients respond to it, but I encourage you to talk to your doctor about this. It requires that the tumor has the estrogen receptor on it. So that is something that should be present in order for this drug to work. Um, does, do, do you need to take a blood test to see what your estrogen level is? No, you don't. You don't. So that is something, again, I would look at the tumor tissue and uh, preferably have this estrogen receptor expressed for this to work well. What's the name of the drug? It's letrozole. It's or call it aromatase inhibitor. There's several ones out there. My preference is letrozole. I don't know whether anybody here has ever taken it for their ovarian cancer. Um, I can give you more information about this after the, our discussion here. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for coming. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.